session. My name is Ian Schoons. I'm from IDS, also FAC. Um, this session is on BRICS and African agriculture, a topic which was already raised by Adebayo in the opening presentation. We thought we ought to have a session that focused on, on these sort of themes because the engagement of the so-called rising powers is potentially having a major impact on the broader politics and political economy of African agriculture. And of course, next week uh, is the fifth BRICS summit in Durban, uh, South Africa hosting uh, Brazil, Russia, India, and China at that event, where agriculture will also be on the agenda. But what we want to ask in this session is, well, what are the role of these so-called BRICS countries in African agriculture? There are really competing narratives, if you like, about their role, um, ranging from the idea that the, this is a new form of land grabbing colonialism to that this is a new form of post-colonial development South-South cooperation. And between those extremes, of course, there's all sorts of uh, varieties in between. So we're going to have a debate about that. We're also going to have a debate about what lessons can we learn from other countries that might be relevant to uh, African agriculture into the future. There's a lot of talk about models from Brazil or from China that uh, are claimed to be potentially useful as Africa moves forward. And we need to ask which models translate, which models don't, and what are the assumptions and the, un the underlying experiences behind these models which are being promulgated. And particularly, the wider questions of the domestic political economy in Brazil, in China, in India, that are driving these new engagements. So we're absolutely delighted to have a panel this afternoon uh, from four of the BRICS countries. Um, that's the Russians. <laughs> but. Um, uh, really delighted because uh, under Future Agricultures, uh, both under the BRICS uh, the theme and also under the land theme, we've been thinking quite a lot about these, these sort of issues. And we've got a new program of work which involves uh, a number of people on this panel, and there's a, there's a parallel panel that immediately follows this with African colleagues presenting. Uh, and we're building this body of work and... and uh, developing an evidence base that perhaps moves us beyond these polarized positions that uh, all is good and all is bad. But our four specialists bring an enormous amount of experience and I'll introduce them quickly and we will uh, then have a series of four presentations back to back and open it up to discussion. So first we have uh, Arielson Favaretto from uh, Sibrapi and UFABC and from Sao Paulo in Brazil. Uh, who's done a huge amount of work over the years on uh, agrarian political economy issues in Brazil and is working with us in, uh, in this new program, particularly in the context of Mozambique. We also have uh, Sachin Chaturvedi uh, from RIS in uh, New Delhi, who has been uh, has published quite extensively on this issue uh, and has been here as part of the Indian delegation to the uh, BRICS Academic Summit, uh, ac Academic uh, Forum, uh, this last week, uh, and uh, brings a particular international relations perspective to some of these issues. We also have Li Xiaoyun uh, from the Chinese Agricultural University in Beijing, who over the years has worked a lot in Africa and has led a lot of the thinking in the Chinese context about how China-Africa relations around agriculture uh, should emerge and uh, was the lead author in a major book uh, that came out uh, just this last year. And we also have Ruth Hall who leads the uh, land theme uh, of future agricultures and is also a professor at uh, PLAS um, uh, based at uh, UWC here in South Africa. Uh, and she's going to be talking about South Africa in the broader African context. So. Without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Arielson, who's going to kick off. Uh, hold your questions till the end, and uh, we'll, we'll, I'm sure, have an interesting debate. Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to begin with my acknowledgments to Ian, to the organizers, to inviting me to uh, take part in this session. 
And I'd like also to begin with my apologies for my English, but I hope you can uh, understand something at least. Uh, the title of this presentation is uh, The Misconceived Notion of uh, Successful Brazilian Agriculture and Some Difficulties to uh, Endogenize an External Model. Can you pass, please? Uh, my point of departure is that uh, Brazilian agriculture is known as a successful model based on a bimodal structure, a sector based on uh, an agribusiness. Uh, composed by big enterprises and big landowners and a family farming sector. But I could address uh, to this uh, assumption uh, at least three uh, question, questions. Uh, the first one is, is the Brazilian uh, a successful model? Second, uh, is there a peaceful coexistence between sectors in Brazilian agriculture? And third, uh, is that a transferable model? Uh, I have only uh, just uh, 10 minutes, but uh, I will try to do my opinion uh, about these three, uh, three questions. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd said uh, it's not a model. Uh, for a, a big picture, uh, we have in Brazil uh, 5.1 million of units, uh, around 80% 80, 80, uh, 80 are family farm units and uh, 800,000 of non-family farmer uh, units. Uh, in spite of the predominance of family farmer uh, units, uh, we have, in terms of uh, production, uh, more or less 66% uh, of the Brazilian production in agriculture concentrated in uh, the non-family farmer uh, sector. In other words, uh, in spite of uh, the number, the majority of uh, units uh, in family farmer sector and in spite of uh, the most part of people involved in agri agriculture in Brazil uh, is uh, on family farmer sector, we have an uh, uh, inverse proportion uh, of uh, wealth generated in agriculture uh, with a predominance of uh, the big farmers, the big enterprises in Brazilian agriculture. But uh, the most important number here is that we have 1.3 million of family farmers properties without monetary income. Uh, in one word, it's not a model because it's a model that generates uh, important wealth, but uh, it's a model that generates also poverty and uh, inequality. Because of this, I'd said also that it is a com complementary uh, and contradictory uh, coexistence. The official discourse in Brazil is that, well, uh, we have a complementary model based on big enterprises and in a family farmer sector. It's true, but it's also true that this uh, coexistence uh, is not peaceful. It's a contradictory um, coexistence. I'd said uh, we have not two models uh, of agriculture, but at least five agriculture segments uh, in Brazil. We have a set of sectors in uh, agribusiness, composed by the, uh, uh, the modern uh, agriculture in Brazil that we call the agribusiness uh, sector with high level of productivity and income. But we have also uh, among uh, the uh, big enterprises in Brazil, a sector based on big land owners. This is a sector with uh, low level of technical modernization and productivity, uh, and it's a sector that survives uh, because uh, the political power. And this political power is due to the dominance between a uh, first sector of family farmers that we call in Brazil the peripheral family farming. This is one sector, this, uh, in this sector we have the majority of uh, family farming in Brazil. But also in family farming, we have an intermediate sector and a consolidated uh, family farming uh, sector. In Brazil, as you know, you can back please. Uh, as you know, we have two uh, federal structures for agriculture, uh, the Ministry of Agriculture and the uh, Ministry for uh, agrarian development. The policies uh, uh, that uh, we find in the Ministry of Agriculture 
is uh, targeted to this sector and to this sector. And the MEDA, the Minister of Development Agrarian Policies, is targeted to uh, this uh, sector. In other words, we have the most part of uh, family farming in Brazil without uh, properly uh, agricultural policies. This is a picture uh, of the different sectors uh, that we can find in Brazilian agriculture, just to take an idea that we have first two uh, models or two discourses or two uh, set of policies uh, for family farming in for uh, big enterprises and uh, to underline that uh, we have two sectors uh, without exactly uh, agricultural policies. Uh, because of this, uh, we have not only one face of Brazilian agriculture, but several. This maybe is the most uh, known uh, face of Brazilian agriculture, a big production, a modern production with high technology. But this is also another face of Brazilian agriculture with destruction, erosion of biodiversity, and uh, etc. And also, we have a face of uh, family farm production in Brazil, generating wealth, uh, welfare, but also uh, a poor and uh, maintenance of the poverty in Brazilian agriculture. Uh, this uh, coexistence and this uh, contradiction uh, we can find in uh, Brazilian agriculture is, uh, as, uh, is a result of uh, uh, several uh, processes. One of them is the role of uh, political conditions. The coexistence between big enterprises and family farmers in Brazil is not a simple consequence of public policies well designed. On the contrary, uh, I'd said that public policies are a consequence of social pressure, of social movements uh, in, in Brazil. Uh, we have two, uh, two moments, two key moments in Brazilian agriculture. The first one is uh, placed in the 60s and mainly in the 70s, uh, where uh, the modern Brazilian big, agricultures, big agriculture um, rises as an answer to problems of food scarcity and social conflicts uh, at, those, at this moment under uh, the military dictatorship. And other important moment is in the 90s, when family farming policies were also adopted as an answer to the pressure ex exercised by uh, rural social movements. What I'd like to underline here is that uh, in these two moments, uh, we had endogenous forces driving changes and the constitution of local coalitions around policy making. A second important element is the role uh, of a strong state uh, in Brazil. Uh, there were uh, some political and institutional requirements to the constitution of the instruments, of instruments responsible for the success, the called the success of Brazilian agriculture, structured uh, around CX, six axes. Uh, the constitution of a national credit system, the constitution of a national research system, also a national training si system, uh, national infrastructures, uh, the role of the state uh, promoting uh, multi-sectoral uh, integration and coordination, and more recently uh, with uh, a strong social policy uh, against poverty. The idea is that a uh, strong state was necessary in Brazil uh, to finance and, and to coordinate the modernization process, uh, to adapt the technologies, to create the capacities. This, plus the social actors driving state policies, is uh, the main uh, forces behind uh, uh, the Brazilian agriculture. And uh, we have also the role of some extra uh, agriculture factors. This is important because uh, when I speak about uh, agriculture, naturally, uh, our, um, our emphasis uh, is put on uh, agricultural policies, the political process around uh, policy making for uh, agriculture. However, uh, we find in Brazil today 
uh, different uh, territorial consequences of uh, the agricultural development uh, that we can, uh, we just can explain uh, with some known agriculture factors. The idea is that uh, to achieve high levels of production, I need infrastructure, technologies, investment, access to markets. Uh, this is important factors we can find in Brazilian experience. But uh, this uh, combination of factors have some uh, social negative impact. Caused, caused by uh, agribusiness technology intensive model and its subsequent low necessity of workforce. Or in other words, uh, the Brazilian model of big agriculture generates a lot of poverty. This can be offset by decentralized urbanization and economic diversification, creating local markets and other opportunities to absorb excess uh, workforce. This is a uh, reality uh, we can find in some regions in Brazil, but this is a reality we can't find in other regions. Where we have not this model of decentralized uh, urbanization and diversification of the uh, uh, productive, local productive system, we have uh, uh, a persistent uh, poverty and inequality. Another uh, problem we have with uh, our model of brick agriculture is uh, environmental problems derived from intensive use of water and soil or derived from loss of biodiversity. This is not exactly a, a fatality. Uh, it could be offset by low input and high diversification technologies, ecological requirements of uh, future agriculture, but this technology, this uh, knowledge man, is not avail available for uh, large-scale use. And then we have uh, this uh, kind of trade-off between uh, the high levels of production and the social and environmental problems derived from uh, the Brazilian model. The next, please. Uh, to, uh, to finish, um, I'd like to uh, address some issues from African agriculture. Uh, as I said, uh, this is just a big picture of uh, uh, the Brazilian agriculture. I have no time to, uh, to do it in more uh, details, but I also, uh, I'd like to underline that uh, the Brazilian experience uh, don't, can, uh, don't can be seen uh, as uh, a model. I'd said the Brazilian, uh, Brazilian agriculture is uh, an experience. And as an experience, uh, it should be received in Africa as a complex and contradictory experience. It is necessary for each country interested in the Brazilian uh, experience to choose what aspects uh, to be applied and uh, mainly under what institutional conditions, rules, and incentives it's possible to do it. Uh, the question here is, uh, is important to use Brazilian uh, experience to building capacities beyond to import uh, resources. Uh, one uh, learning uh, from Brazilian experience is that in the 60s, uh, Brazil uh, didn't have also uh, expertise uh, resources and etc. But uh, the role of the state, the role of uh, the civil society, social, move, social movements, but also the entrepreneurial sector uh, was uh, important to create local conditions uh, to, uh, uh, to build uh, capacities and to go beyond uh, the importation of uh, resources. The idea is that external resources are needed to boost African agriculture, yet the local capacities need to be built. Uh, in this context, we can uh, talk in terms of opportunities and problems. In terms of opportunities, the main opportunity, in my opinion, is that uh, it's an opportunity to uh, achieve a new model, uh, not to copy, not to adapt, but to construct a new model leveraging foreign expertise and uh, resources. Uh, in contests uh, like this, there are also problems. And the main uh, problem here is the risk of dependence and the reproduction of uh, exogenous uh, trade-offs. 
uh, I tried to show uh, here that uh, there are elements of uh, success and there are a lot of trade-offs that uh, the social movements and the public debate in Brazil are trying to, to face. And then I think uh, African countries have the opportunity to uh, go uh, beyond uh, the situation we have today uh, in Brazil. That is, thank you. I was just thinking uh, what uh, when uh, uh, we started this exercise in uh, India in terms of mapping out India's development cooperation across the sectors, not just agriculture, but across the board. And then this question was coming up time and again in terms of seeing what exactly we are exporting in terms of engagement, in terms of partnership, in terms of ideas. And uh, as my colleague from Brazil pointed out, whether it is uh, really a model or is it a experience. And I think it's, it's uh, uh, really something that we would have to decipher and, and work out in terms of its details as to what exactly we mean when we say uh, exporting some sort of model and, and, and what we are going to export, is it our own model? And that's what I think is coming up with, uh, uh, with agriculture in, in, in much more forceful manner. Uh, the, the pattern of uh, evolution of agriculture in India, to what extent uh, uh, that's uh, endogenous in its, uh, in its contents and in, in its approach. And the kind of uh, uh, modifications that we had in, in uh, last couple of years with the renewed debate on, on post-green revolution phase, I think we would have to be extremely careful in terms of uh, getting the ideas across right. And, and uh, those of us who have followed the uh, IASTD uh, report, I was fortunately part of that process, we have seen what different experiences are coming up from, from regions. So when we talk of bricks in agriculture, is it a monolithic uh, structure that, that we are going to uh, think of or, or, is, or it has uh, its own regional specificities and country specific dimensions. So I think these are the uh, um, uh, uh, sort of caveats with which I, I just quickly make my presentation. I, I know I have 10 minutes and I would try to do justice with that. Uh, what I, I'm trying to do here is in terms of uh, uh, building up on uh, on what kind of uh, issues we have in terms of our own development experience. And as you know, uh, the, the most important feature in India's development planning right after independence was in terms of creating manpower and in terms of creating skill manpower across uh, industrial sector, across agriculture. So that I think is, is one important dimension which, uh, uh, can we change now? Next slide. So, uh, so that I think is, uh, is uh, important in terms of uh, 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 trying to see uh, what exactly is the, is the dimension and uh, how we have tried to uh, uh, link up the idea of, uh, uh, with, with the concept of uh, human resource development. I don't think if that's the right, right one, no. Can you copy it, John, as well, sir? So, so what we have tried to do uh, here in, in, uh, in our engagement with Africa is in terms of uh, uh, trying to see what exactly is in terms of requirements of uh, manpower building. And, uh, and you see in, in media, and Ian also uh, alluded to that, uh, we have tried to see how uh, this whole concept of uh, uh, engagement started uh, right in early years of 50s and once the slides would come up, uh, uh, I would show you, uh, yeah, uh, largely trying to show how uh, theoretically uh, also it is argued out in terms of a development model, what uh, exactly is the role of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, trained and skilled manpower in which we have tried to s see how this knowledge sharing is extremely important, at what level we can engage in and at what level we have tried to uh, have a sort of uh, uh, larger dimension. And if you uh, see Rolf Previs' work, we, we try to see how uh, skill manpower can, can uh, uh, compensate for a large capital deficit that is, uh, uh, that is possible uh, uh, in any kind of setup. Uh, we also have uh, uh, this idea of uh, how the R&D institutions are, are extremely important. And that's where I think the point that he uh, raised in the, in the beginning in terms of national priorities and, and R&D engagement whether it's in, in uh, uh, advanced technologies within biotechnology or in a, any other sector, how that is important. So from that perspective, uh, skill manpower is of uh, key significance uh, and that I think is, uh, is extremely important and that's where uh, uh, we are engaging in, in terms of uh, uh, 
uh, human resource development, and also in terms of trying to see how with the larger south we can, uh, uh, we can, uh, uh, we can manage. Uh, what I'm trying to do here now is uh, uh, the in Indian engagement in uh, Africa. I find that there are four broad areas within which this engagement has emerged. One is in terms of uh, uh, policy and, and training support, uh, then augmenting capacity to deal with diseases and other challenges like locust and, and, uh, and other uh, areas of work. Third is providing agriculture gadgets for uh, adaptable, appropriate, and affordable uh, technology. And then through lines of credit, uh, uh, supporting uh, uh, the agriculture gadgets that are, uh, that are important. Policy and training, uh, uh, the, uh, um, uh, in 2006, India has started this India-Africa summit in which uh, uh, several uh, decisions have been taken. But of key, key significance here are the uh, agriculture uh, training centers which have come across uh, a couple of countries in which uh, the government has supported uh, several of the training programs, the, the fellowship programs, the uh, uh, training on, on field, and also uh, uh, transfer of uh, uh, technology. Uh, then we find uh, uh, a sort of uh, a program in which uh, uh, the trilateral uh, partnership is coming up in which India and, and US and others are participating. I would come back to that a little later. But, but the fact that the fellowships under the TDC program are emerging is, is an interesting uh, feature. Uh, yeah, next. Uh, then are the uh, issues which are in terms of uh, uh, trying to see how uh, uh, in specific countries, and I'm uh, picking up Ethiopia for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, detailed discussion, is in terms of supporting uh, uh, the, the land acquisition, which I think has attracted huge media attention and, and debate. And, and I would just like to mention here that if I see uh, the earlier uh, literature on this, and I go back 1953 when uh, on request of uh, uh, Ethiopia, India sent farmers. So it's not a new phenomenon. It has been historically there. The, the data is there. The details are available. So something which has been happening for, uh, for quite long now, and, and the kind of uh, uh, media glaze that it has uh, uh, come in, I think we would have to uh, uh, look into, uh, into that in terms of uh, what extent it is adversely affecting. Then uh, uh, that is also because part of the national plan, because uh, in the morning session today itself, we had uh, uh, this issue to what extent the uh, national priorities are fitting in this uh, plan of uh, BRICS countries in their investment in agriculture. I think in case of Ethiopia, it is the growth and transformation plan, GTP, which has already uh, initiated uh, uh, ideas in terms of their engagement and, uh, and trying to see what uh, exactly can be done. Next, please. Uh, there is also this uh, uh, experience, again, in, in Yemen. And then in, in 1964, uh, uh, when India sent uh, um, uh, key economic experts to support policy planning and, and trying to see how agriculture scenarios can be worked out in terms of supporting uh, uh, the broad uh, uh, economic development framework. So from that historical context, I think the, the policy and training support is, uh, uh, is extremely important. Uh, there are also uh, areas of engagement with, uh, with Mozambique, and I think uh, after Ethiopia, Mozambique, and, and, uh, and then Senegal. These are the three uh, very important partners which have emerged over the years where India's engagement is uh, across the board, not only on policy and uh, uh, training, but also in terms of uh, uh, providing gadgets and, uh, and other areas. Uh, then are, uh, are the uh, issues where uh, policy and training is also in terms of uh, uh, um, uh, 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 trying to share and transfer India's own uh, green revolution experience, uh, which is uh, uh, trying to support the larger structure of uh, uh, not only the engagement with the smaller economies, but also in terms of those which have identified green revolution as, as one, of the, um, uh, uh, one of the routes for uh, agriculture productivity and, uh, and higher food production levels. Then is, uh, uh, is the question of uh, uh, trying to see how uh, uh, the, the agriculture development project, which was uh, launched in Senegal, as I said, uh, uh, was also supplemented and supported by India through uh, several initiatives. One was in terms of uh, uh, trying to transfer better varieties of uh, uh, several different uh, uh, um, uh, uh, crops. Also trying to see how uh, scientific support is required in terms of training of, uh, uh, of uh, scientists and also uh, in terms of providing uh, laboratory-based support 
in, in Senegal. So that I think is, uh, is, uh, is important and uh, uh, we have also tried to uh, see where gadgets are, are of uh, importance. I'm not getting into the numbers and would quickly just run through uh, some of these slides, maybe I think I can manage it fast. Uh, in terms of uh, trying to see how uh, uh, the lines of credits are uh, uh, supporting India in terms of uh, uh, um, uh, what exactly is to be brought and that's where uh, I think the uh, national priorities come in and uh, uh, at the 2008 uh, India-Africa Summit, uh, $5 billion were, were awarded in terms of uh, credit lines and they have become a major support in terms of dissemination of uh, large number of activities. The last is uh, uh, this idea of uh, uh, triangular development cooperation in agriculture which has uh, assumed key significance in uh, uh, India's approach where uh, India has engaged uh, uh, in, in the first place with the United States uh, where uh, they have identified uh, uh, fellowship programs, training programs, and also uh, infrastructure building for, for agriculture. So with these three areas, the, uh, the knowledge initiative has advanced. The uh, first training program uh, uh, is uh, uh, with, with support of uh, uh, a couple of institutions which are, uh, which are there. And there again, the focus is on three specific countries, uh, uh, Kenya, Liberia, and, and, and Malawi, where specific crops are chosen, and they are being addressed in terms of uh, 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 training and support program. Uh, also, there is this idea that uh, what India has indigenously achieved, that should be emphasized rather than getting on the U.S. experience with agriculture. And there I would, I picked up just two examples to show. Uh, one is uh, process and business model innovation. So India's experience with dairy industry, particularly Amul, which came up as a major brand out of the farmers cooperatives and, and uh, 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 with the forward linkage uh, in the uh, agriculture sector, that has uh, emerged as a major success area. The second is this holistic uh, uh, innovation where uh, uh, agrochemical companies are, are part of uh, uh, the, the strategy. So, so keeping private sector out of it is something that, uh, uh, that is uh, after 1990s uh, uh, liberalization process India has shed off and more and more of them are being integrated in the agriculture sector. So they come up with products which are specific uh, uh, to specific agriculture regions. So that I think is of uh, a key significance. This uh, January we got uh, uh, something like 160, 180 agriculture uh, um, professionals from uh, these three countries who have come for uh, a training program. Uh, then uh, uh, TDC I have already discussed. Uh, uh, I would not get into that. And, and last, I think, is uh, uh, very important to, uh, when India has uh, requested MS Swaminathan to uh, get on board in terms of engagement with a couple of African countries in terms of alternative agriculture practices. The idea is not to focus on organic uh, production uh, approach alone, but how that can be, as uh, uh, Professor Swaminathan calls it, as, uh, as evergreen uh, revolution, how we can really reconcile uh, the natural practices. That, that debate is, is huge and, and we don't have much time now, uh, but uh, uh, that's the another uh, area of engagement which uh, India is looking forward for. Thank you. And many people argue that China has been here for land grabbing and many other issues, sometimes positive, sometimes negative. And I like quite informally, not very formally to use data, but quite informally, to respond to that interaction because, because um, the first is that I see uh, the China-African interaction in the agriculture has twofold implications. And the first is that uh, when I look at uh, the op opportunity and if you see the recent uh, import uh, projection what China has uh, that uh, and I used the data last year uh, 20, uh, 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 2012. And uh, if you see the last year for the wheat, uh, maize, and the rice, China has uh, imported over 15 million tons, 15 million tons, plus over, plus over 12 million tons soybean. And, uh, and if you see the structure of this uh, uh, geographic structure of this uh, import, and uh, almost 90% of soybean imported from Brazil, and the large substantial amount of green imported from North America, 
largely from the United States, uh, Canada, and uh, Australia. And uh, this does not include uh, other cash crops like tobacco, like uh, sugar, like other issues. And I see with the increasing demand for grains and also the agricultural products in China. And this is a huge market demand would, would suggest in the future that Africa could become one of alternatives. And uh, politically, this provides, I would see from, from, from Chinese perspective, that uh, we too much depend on Latin America and North America in terms of uh, this kind of international supply. And uh, you know, the, supply and the striking for the Chinese public and, and the political uh, level was uh, China never import maize. So we had a large scale of uh, maize belt in China. And four years, three years ago, we start import maize, and the people did not pay attention. But this year, we a substantial two million, and over next year, three, four million maize will be impo imported. So we have started negotiating with Argentina because they provide cheaper maize. So we want to get rid of kind of monopoly supply from the United States. So politically, I would see China would like to see the African as a way that we would leverage this kind of global supply and the demand relationship from Chinese perspective politically. And that actually responded, I'm not going to say definitely, that would respond to the increasing interest from, Chi from China domestically that so many interest in investing agriculture. I'm not going to say land grabbing because many people are coming for land you know, issues, but I would say generally that um, that that provides a picture incentive, political and economic incentive for this. And I would say, again, the positively, that um, if, the, if China would increase, if China would start by, by maize, a soybean, which could produce in all parts of East and West Africa, and even rice, in a competitive global market, a global price, and this, this, would have, this would have a tremendous impact for power reduction. And I have told, as my friend uh, Hans here, I have told the Tanzania government, you know, and in the Southern Corridor, so you could easily raise the yield into two, three million tons maize, which is nothing for you. But the, you could reach for two, three million people's poverty very easily. So from that perspective, I would say, either from economic incentive from African and from political in incentive from Chinese side, so this interaction would have, uh, I'm not going to necessarily say negative, that would have kind of interesting dynamic in the future to reshape the global uh, uh, agricultural trade issues. And uh, from that way, and uh, we were thinking that um, this kind of economic drives, economic drive would also turn the afro agro pessimistic way into more optimistic way. So this is something which um, I would say the first, uh, uh, first uh, perspective that I can see uh, that China African in the field of agriculture interactions. And uh, politically, you will see the new president of China will put his first uh, step f official visit to Africa. And his first visit will be in Tanzania, then be, there will be South Africa and Congo. So this said clearly that. Uh, I'm not going to see only for agriculture, but I would see Africa is so important. Many people looking for minerals, uh, petrols, things, but I would see the agriculture certainly. And um, I have never heard anything, somebody ask me, that you have any policy to encourage your companies coming for land? I said, no, I haven't seen it, because uh, I could clearly see the ambassador, Chinese ambassador in Tanzania told the private investor to say, you can do everything you want, but if you do the land things, don't come. So this is the way of, uh, I'm not going to say they have or not have, but I'm going to say this very controversial politically and the Chinese, Chinese authorities quite careful and quite, quite sensible for these issues. And, uh, and secondly, I see uh, the relationship between China and Africa uh, in the field of agriculture, I see that uh, opportunity in the sense of uh, mm, this, uh, this kind of interaction also provide kind of uh, uh, experiences and learning, uh, experiences lessons sharing and learning. And uh, given the fact that China, has China and Africa 
you could see a tremendous difference in, ter in terms of social, cultural, political scenario. You see the geographic distributions and China is one country. Africa is, 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 is many countries, continents. You know, you can't, you can't compare, you can't see what, but again, and this does not prevent, this does not prevent we draw the lesson and the experiences in very, very levels that we practice agriculture in the sense of very universal way. And you can't see the agriculture in Africa and agriculture in the United States and in Europe and in Asia, Asia, India, China, some somehow tremendous difference you can't see. And they're all farmers, you know, they're all doing the field, and you know, you, you see a lot lot of kind of universal practices. And from that perspective, I would like to emphasize a number of issues where I, I can see we could go mutual benefit. And uh, and firstly, and I have listened this morning plenary section I have was also in the in the in the discussions, you know, I listened to this discussion. So I will see a number of issues here. It's quite interesting. And the first interesting is that um, and I have personally uh, worked in Africa and I began my first uh, uh, African experience in nineteen ninety and spent uh, almost like a year in Tanzania for my field study. And I came back after fifteen years 2005, that I realized that many people talk about China African. I said, well, I had early experience with African, why not just come to African? So I came to Africa and began to work in Tanzania. And uh, my knowledge about African is very, very limited. And, uh, and uh, sometimes maybe my understanding and the reaction of Africa and China is very ignorant, you know, very ignorant. So please accuse my ignorance. And I had some kind of a thinking share with my African friends here. The first that I have seen so many actors in Africa. <coughs> actors mean you have international bilateral donors, you have multilateral donors, you have NGOs, you have international NGOs, you have national NGOs, you have private sectors, you have so many, many actors in the field of agriculture in Africa. And those actors, from my perspective, is disturbing, just disturbing. I'm not just good or bad, it's just disturbing. You, you just imagine. So you have the family life, and many actors come in to interfere you. So you cannot manage this. So uh, this is this is very Chinese experience. It's not it's not right or wrong. You know, I'm just just very experiences. So many so many actors, but it's one important actor f for the agri for the, for the, for the, for the, for the agriculture for the small farmer is the state actor. But it, sometimes you can't see, and you have so many plans, strategies, and the programs. But you don't see on the field much. And I was working, and I'm working, I just came from my own field in Mologoro in Tanzania before I came here. I spent three days in the field with my farmers. I said, no, you have so many programs. Killing me, Kwanza, everything, many, many programs. I don't see nothing here, you know. But practi practical is very easy. Therefore, now I would say you know, how to make anything on the ground. This is, is, is essentially, essentially important. Rather than just looking for different programs on farm research or different issues, you know, complicated. I'm, I'm considered very complicated. It's, it's not a complicated issue. I'm not going to criticize, you know, I'm also doing these similar things, you know. And uh, that is some kind of uh, what I can say, the role of state, state building, commitment, uh, and, uh, and the political politics of agriculture itself. And I was asking Chinese, uh, Chinese state, Chinese leaders are not freely elected, not democratically elected. Why the policy is pro-peasant, pro-agriculture? Why the state leaders and officials, all these here, actually are free elected? They should, those farmers should elect them, you know? And they should represent the farmers' interests. Why not? So these are the issues. And I would see, and uh, the state is the why, which I would see how the state would do this and uh, this is something which I would say the capacity building areas where we're looking for these areas, we can share a lot. But the Chinese state is too long, long term, uh, strong, and we cannot, African, African is a very short period of time, you know, we can't see Ch African should learn from China. But I would see that point called the developmental state. And the Richard, you know, we were, you just came in, we were doing this China study group, we we're looking for this strong state building and the uh, environmental state, and I will discuss this morning. I'm not going to repeat this one. And uh, learning, and learning means uh, 
uh, the lack of learning process that put experimentation into large scale, all this procedure learning, you know, these are issues we could certainly do it. Now secondly, and the secondly is that um, I like to emphasize the kind of small scale farmer and the small scale farmer transformation is essentially important looking for two, two dimensions. One is for whole economic transformation and secondly for the power reduction. And the, if the small scale farmer cannot be transferred, counting African, but in country, particularly country, times are not working. And agriculture is under underemployed. The often you find people, you often you find households have not enough labor to do farming. And uh, at the same time, you found young people, young strong laborers, you know, and they're on the streets selling those, uh, you know, peanut, everything there, and doing nothing. And even doing, you know, very, very lowly paid, uh, underpaid job, under underpaid job. So you see the interaction between, su between rural and urban, and agriculture does not have attraction to attract employment. So agriculture, small scale agriculture, if small scale agriculture cannot be transferred, and the whole economy cannot be transferred, and then, and, uh, and the power reduction, as Ms. Hans mentioned, that power reduction, you have everything's done, you have good health, health education, everything, but poverty is still striking there. So, and the whole, whole, whole situation is worse. So, my last point here is that um, um, small scale agriculture, what does it mean this? And uh, from the Chinese experience, it means not subsidy, and uh, because we didn't subsidy agriculture farmer until recently, and if African friends come to China now to learn from Chinese agriculture, I said, be cautious, don't learn, don't learn now, today. Because today's agriculture is highly subsidized and is polluted, and a lot of problems. This is not what you learn. And you're going to learn 1970s, 1980s, when the agriculture raised 10 years growth, 9%, and the poverty reduction already down to 50%, from 1978 to, 1990 to 1986, seven years. So those seven years, we had 15% economic growth, and the agricultural growth contributed 40% of that growth rate, and agriculture grew at 9% over seven years, and the farmer's income increased three, four times. And that time, there's no subsidy, there was no many significant, there's never provided credit. For what? Because farmer has to, farmer has to use their labor to contribute for community level infrastructure, for roads, irrigation, everything. So you need accumulate capital. So Chinese model simply, and the agriculture is the source of industrialization for a long time by sacrifice labor, everything. So that experience is not applied today. It's African, you can't do it. You cannot order farmer to do this field work, but there's various ways looking for, for, for this kind of uh, contributions from, from, from smallholder agriculture. So smallholder, Hotter agriculture is not, not something which you provide everything free, support there to grow things, but you have to really consider that um, this is a very difficult situation. So thank you very much for this. Uh, time is tight, and in case I don't get to the end, I want to start with my conclusions. The first of which is I want to emphasize while there's been a lot of attention given to the, the expansion of South African farmers elsewhere in Africa, I think we need to understand that this is a real phenomenon, but it's better understood as an expansion of agribusiness uh, from South Africa into the rest of the region. Uh, and that this is a chain-wide process. It's a mistake to look at only primary agriculture uh, involved in this process. Second uh, is to say that the context in which this is happening is one in which there's been a dramatic restructuring of commercial agriculture in South Africa since the early 1990s, a process that's produced winners and losers and is the context which is uh, incentivizing this movement elsewhere into the continent. And the third is to make clear that the context in which uh, this expansion is happening is one in which the conditions in which, uh, under which this large-scale commercial farming sector, this capitalist sector, was successfully constructed over a century of state intervention in South Africa, that context no longer exists. Uh, that level of state intervention, uh, regulation, protection, and subsidization no longer exists in South Africa. So we're really looking at exporting a model, but without the mechanisms through which that model was successfully created for political purposes in South Africa. Uh, just to say, South Africa is the newest brick, uh, joining a club in which we're slightly out of our depth. Uh, <laughs> Uh, 
by some measures, South Africa is in the mid-range of the BRICS with average income uh, not too dissimilar from some of our um, compatriots. Uh, secondly, human de by Human Development Index, South Africa is also um, there with the others around the mid-range. Uh, but in terms of the overall scale of the economy, it's clear that we are, in fact, the mini-BRIC. Uh, there perhaps... Uh, giving effect to perhaps Thabo Mbeki's wish that there should be an African renaissance in which South Africa would play a key role, but perhaps uh, somewhat tokenistically, uh, the African representative in the South-South Club. I want to emphasize that uh, this strong discourse on land grabs in Africa has caught uh, attention and particularly the role of South Africa uh, as one example of intra-regional uh, investment deals. So while a lot of attention is focused on uh, South Korea, China, the Gulf states, uh, and others, in fact, South Africa, together with a handful of others in Africa, are the exceptions, uh, the investor states, rather than merely the destination states for large-scale corporate investments. So this is the view that IFPRI has put together, uh, depicting uh, countries that are leasing out land, leasing in land, and you can see South Africa standing out as really the exception. Uh, within the continent, together with, to a more minor extent, Egypt and, in the past, Libya. But the context for this is the creation of a dualistic agricultural sector in South Africa um, from the late 18th uh, century, uh, late 19th century, uh, through to the creation of native reserves through the uh, Natives Land Act. We will be coming up, as Professor Lakushi said, to the centenary of the Natives Land Act uh, later this year, a process that set aside native reserves and prohibited uh, black occupation of farmland in the rest of the country, a foundation for the extraction of cheap surplus labor, both in the agricultural sector and in the fast uh, developing mining sector. This is a map that was consolidated through the 20th century into the picture at uh, 1990, uh, where you can see that uh, a small number of self-governing territories or ostensibly independent black homelands uh, were scattered around the country while the vast majority was reserved for white commercial farming that was heavily subsidized. So the late 1980s and uh, quite dramatically into the 1990s saw a process of agricultural deregulation and liberalization where a whole panoply of systems of subsidy uh, were removed, including uh, floor pr prices, compulsory marketing through state marketing boards, um, uh, uh, subsidized interest rates, and a huge array of systems uh, of subsidy and protection. At the same time as in the post-sanctions era, the very rapid liberalization of agricultural trade. Uh, South Africa moved from being one of the most protected uh, agricultural sectors in the world to being the second least subsidized by the early 2000s. So a dramatic restructuring took place uh, within what was called white commercial agriculture, um, particularly uh, the decline in the smaller family farm and the growth of more vertically integrated agribusinesses, uh, often very strongly integrated into input industries and particularly into downstream processing and marketing uh, processes. Um, at the same time as this rapid deregulation, the introduction of new forms of regulation, labor regulation, uh, people may be aware of a rapid uh, increase in farm work and minimum wages, but we've seen a restructuring of agriculture, uh, a shift towards job shedding, a continuation of mechanization uh, that, that has been seen for several decades now, um, um, and new agricultural investment models emerging within the context of a land reform process, favoring of various kinds of joint ventures between large established agribusinesses and small holders. But what I would emphasize here is that while this restructuring has been happening, uh, and while uh, the white commercial farming sector has been shrinking from about 60,000 to about 40,000 units uh, since the end of apartheid, what has been largely neglected, um, as in the Brazilian example, is a very large family farming sector concentrated in the remains of those former reserves or communal areas. Uh, about 250,000 farmers farming primarily for income, and by some estimates, as, when, as much as two and a half million households farming on a part-time basis, primarily for food for consumption. So we also have this heavily dualistic sector in which uh, the growth of agribusiness and particularly the growth of marketing of processed and packaged foods 
in the deep rural areas has under, undercut the profitability and feasibility of small-scale farming, where small-scale family farmers are now uh, by far net, uh, net food buyers. So as well as having a land reform process and regulating labor, we now have debates within national policy discourse about uh, systems of regulating land access, land ceilings, and even a prohibition or regulation of foreign investment of land, quite ironically <laughs> uh, contradictory to the role that uh, South Africa plays in the region. And importantly, part of this uh, deregulation process seen the demise of state-supported finance for agriculture. So the land bank, which was key to creating this commercial farming sector, now is meant to balance a mandate to develop small-scale farmers and particularly black emerging commercial farmers with being self-financing. So overall, the uh, most agricultural finance now is coming from the commercial sector uh, with state institutions like the Development Bank of South Africa, uh, Southern Africa, IDC and Kula playing a much more minor role. So we're seeing a growth of, of private sector financing for agriculture. One of the images of South Africa's expansion into the rest of Africa comes from the, uh, the International Land Coalition's land matrix which shows just a small scattering of projects in which South African uh, farmers and farming companies are acquiring land for production elsewhere in Africa and a couple in Latin America. But I would argue this is a very incomplete image of what is happening. So while a lot of focus has fallen on Agriculture South Africa, that's the Commercial Farmers Association, which has been in, negotiating, in, in negotiations with 22 African governments uh, for concessions on land. What's less understood and less uh, quantified are the range of agribusinesses and all the other actors in, in the value chain who are becoming much more integrated into African agriculture. Uh, from, most notably, uh, the sugar industry, um, Ilovo, Tongat, Hewlett, and formerly Transvaal, Seco, Babek. Uh, but also the whole value chain, uh, input industries, processing, packaging, logistics, um, and agricultural finance, the commercial banks, and importantly also, uh, investment funds that are not South African focused but have their base within South Africa, and a prime example would be emergent asset management. Also, the food giants, and I want to mention a few of them, but particularly Tiger Brand stands out as a large one, and the supermarkets. ShopRite now has several hundred uh, outlets across 18 countries in Africa and the Indian Ocean Islands. Uh, this is impossible to see, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, but what it is is a listing of the top 20 African agribusinesses, of which uh, eight of the top 10 are South African, and many of which now have, are operating from bases in multiple countries, so including Tiger Brands, Pioneer Foods, Tongat Hewlett, Afgri, uh, Ilovo, Anglaval, and Rainbow Chicken. And just looking at a, a sense of where the big agribusinesses are spread through, through Africa, we can see that South Africa, across a variety of different sectors, uh, including uh, food and paper and various grains, uh, and uh, chicken is a major player. So how is this framed in South Africa and in policy discourse? There's a strong narrative about the importance of regional integration, uh, South Africa's role in promoting an African rena renaissance and South-South cooperation, and our national uh, medium-term uh, strategic framework identifies integration of agri with African agriculture as one of its top ten priorities. Indeed, South Africa's investment in the rest of the continent is growing faster than overall investment, but still, it's relatively small compared to the overall uh, basket of South African investment abroad. But what I would like to emphasize is that rather than necessarily being the origin of investment in African agriculture, South Africa is now presenting itself as the gateway to Africa. Um, and, uh, and this is happening in various ways. Our recent uh, industrial action plan identifies the importance of infrastructure investments and corridor developments, not only for agriculture, but particularly for the mineral energy complex. Uh, but a lot of this involves what is called plantation to port infrastructure. This includes the, the Congo Development Corridor, uh, the Mozambique uh, Development Initiative, Malawi, Tanzania Industrial Development uh, Cluster, and a scoping study looking at regional integration of value chains, particularly uh, in food, in agro-processing. 
And another uh, key example of a way in which South Africa is presenting itself as a gateway to investment in Africa, and particularly in African agriculture, are the recently announced financial reforms uh, put forward in our budget uh, last month by the Minister of Finance, which are aimed at reducing the cost of doing business in Africa from a South African base. And these explicitly set out uh, exemptions for foreign investors wanting to have a base in South Africa through which to invest elsewhere on the continent, which will be exempt from various uh, Reserve Bank exchange controls. And explicitly mentioned are uh, the, the wish for partnerships with Brazil, China, India, and Russia uh, to partner with South African business uh, and to use this as base using South Africa's financial infrastructure from which to launch investments elsewhere. So there are, of course, critiques that what we're seeing is a new corporate carve-up of Africa, and it's clear that South Africa is not always a welcome partner. Uh, indeed, our national development plan concedes that there is a perception of South Africa as a regional bully, um, and that South African policymakers tend to have a weak grasp of African geopolitics. ShopRite is, of course, Africa's largest food retailer, and has done a lot of restructuring of its own value chains to try and address the very criticisms uh, that are referenced there, the criticisms that South African retail is moving into the region uh, and not integrating into local value chains, but bringing their own value chains with them. So there's a debate right now within South Africa, a very live debate in the run-up to the summit next week. Are we seeing a paradigm shift through the BRICS or more of the same? Our Minister of Trade and Industry said this is a historic opportunity for these countries to champion a new paradigm for collaboration, uh, for more sustainable, equitable and mutually beneficial development. Uh, not everyone is convinced. Indeed, there, there is a mounting campaign within South Africa by activists and intellectuals who are talking about an alternative BRICS from below and trying to partner with uh, social movements and others from the other BRICS to hold an alternative discussion about the, role, the roles of these countries in Africa. Um, so they're skeptical of the anti-imperialist claims of the BRICS powers talking about old wine in new bottles. Uh, the argument is that the kinds of development being promoted are maldevelopment based on elite-centric, consumerist, financialized, eco-destructive, climate-insensitive, and nuclear-powered strategies. I think that many people in this room can guess who wrote that, a particular, <laughs> a particular activist from South Africa. So, uh, as they say, uh, at the summit, five heads of state will meet to assure the rest of Africa that their country's corporations are better investors in infrastructure, mining, oil, and agriculture than the traditional European and US multinationals. So, that is the critique. So I come to uh, some final thoughts. Is South Africa exporting its model, and, uh, and how do we understand the history and origins of this model? It's clear that there is an export of South African agriculture and agribusiness into the rest of the continent, but the scale of this is, is quite murky and unknown. One of the problems is that data has been reproduced. A lot of proposed investment, proposed deals have been, uh, have been recorded, uh, but many of them have not actually gone ahead. An example would be uh, the Agri-South Africa deal in Congo, which was proposed uh, to uh, cover 10 million hectares, then 200,000. A deal was signed for 80,000, um, and only 18,000 has actually been occupied. Um, but also, there's been a biofuels bubble in southern Africa, and a lot of proposed South African investments in sugar for ethanol, but also jatropha, have simply not materialized. But also, South Africa is, is now exporting one of the models that's developed within our own land reform program and in partnerships with small-scale farmers in South Africa, South Africa. And that is a range of inclusive business models, including various permutations of outgrow um, farming. So agribusiness expansion is chain-wide, but this is taking place in a context and w quite unlike the context in which South African commercial farming was established, specifically with facilitation and support from the state, particularly lots of bilateral investment treaties, President Zuma taking business delegations on his trips to other African states, but without the heavy subsidization and support that made this, um, this uh, sector possible in the first place. So this is quite unlike the situation of Brazil, where you have Embrapa, parastatal, specifically supporting agricultural development, or China, where you have state financial institutions playing this absolutely key role. South Africa doesn't come with all of that state support. 
But finally, I'd like to say we should be questioning what we call the national identity of investments. Most of what we're talking about are multinational investments, and it's wrong to think of them simply as being South African or Brazilian. Uh, these are often partnerships, so we need to understand the relative roles of all these countries uh, in this expansion into Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruth, and thank you very much to the whole panel. Um, very tough for everyone to try and keep uh, to a 10-minute slot on such a huge, huge topic. We're going to open up now for 15 minutes, 20 minutes of discussion. Um, so if you want to put up your hand, ask questions to the panel, comments, we'll go around the room. They stunned you into silence. Yes, at the back, right at the back there, and Hans. Oh, the, oh, it has to be, there's only one mic, is that okay? Okay. okay. Hans, you're going to go first. Your uh, I have just a comment on Li Xiaoyun's example of many policies, but they're not reaching the farm level in Tanzania. But that's uh, an issue all over Africa. And I think one lesson which Africa still has to learn from China is the radical decentralization of implementation of policies. In China, policies set by the national government. It's not implemented by the national government or by the provincial government. It is instead implemented by the, uh, by the by the local government, which is called the county, and which com corresponds about to a district. The counties spend about 60% of fiscal resources of China, against about 5% in India, okay? So there's a hugely powerful organization. They raise most of their revenues themselves. They employ all of the people in the health, education, and agricultural sector, so they are accountable to the counties for implementation. And they do uh, have a direct hand in agricultural development, both on the farm and off the farm. I visited two counties, one of which got 150 new agro-enterprises settled into the same county, and another got 100, okay? You haven't ever seen anything like that anywhere in Africa, and it is because your counties or districts have virtually no autonomy and implementation capacity. You're way behind in the reform of the state towards an effective decentralization. Thank you. Uh, in the back there first. And if you can keep your comments uh, short or questions short, that would be brilliant. We'll get more in. Sadly, we started too late, so therefore we're going to have to finish on time. Uh, th thank you for the very um, interesting um, set of presentations which worked well together. I, I just wanted to raise the point, I think, elaborated fr from the presentation from China about the multiplicity of actors um, in, in African uh, agriculture. Because to me, that seems to be one of the most relevant things that we need to be considering and putting the, the bricks alongside a whole array of other actors and trying to understand what this means in terms of our ability to actually control and manage agricultural policy, whether by the state or whether even by citizens themselves. What we find to me, for example, I would, I would even consider a project like Agra to be far more dangerous. I mean, Agra on its own has probably got far more finances than any single Ministry of Finance anywhere. It's got more finances than what the AU agriculture um, uh, units have. And, and, and in a sense, um, set their policies and their programs apart from the cadet processes. So at the end of the day, you end up having a situation where you've got this plethora of actors and you don't actually have any states or any institu institutions which have the strength to direct um, where those resources are supposed to be going.
Hello. Um, I would like to add to what the gentleman from China said about the multiple players. It's a very dangerous thing which is happening. I'll speak from a South African perspective. You've got uh, an NGO which is associated with the biggest retailer in the world um, coming to South Africa, working for the retailer doing NGO work, but in the same time being the advisor to the South African government. So, you know, th then th the lines get so blurry and, and the players so many that, you know, we, we spend a lot of money and a lot of times with policy and a very intellectual debate without anything happening on the ground. Thank you. Thank you very much. My question is to a colleague from India. Uh, I think you have uh, a very good model, and maybe that's why India has done extremely well and has become a net exporter of our cultural products. But I liked the provision of the line of credit. Is that government money or is from the private sector? In other words, are there financial institutions that are providing that? Thank you. My question is to on Brazil. Taking up from the last point that um, Ruth Ho made about multinational investments, in, um, so in, in Brazil, there's a large con Brazilian multi um, agribusiness multinationals now are a huge concerns with um, billions of dollars of investments. Yeah, but they're under considerable pressure from US, yeah. Um, and, and the world of agribusiness is one of um, ruthless takeovers and things. At the same time, there are a lot of European investments in Brazilian agribusiness since the 1990s. And my question is, how, how does this impact and, and influence um, Bra Brazilians' moves towards Africa? In, in the context of um, comp competitiveness in North American <coughs> markets, too. Thank you very much. Uh, my comment goes to my Indian friend, I think. My Indian friend has put, I mean, the Ethiopian Indian land investment in a, I mean, a colorful manner. But, I mean, there are so many problems going on there. Are you aware of, really, I mean, the abduction of some Indian farmers and also the eviction of the local populations, the cry over the, 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 the I mean, the displacement of the poor peasants? Have you heard about these things? And, and also, I think there is, must be some correction. The Indian-Ethiopian relationship historically was all right. I mean, in terms of exchange of teachers and the like, there has never been any relationship on agriculture. And I don't know where do you bring that story of really a long relationship between Ethiopia and India. Thank you. And let's just go down the, the row here, starting with Arielson. Okay. Well, uh, I have one, one question about uh, investments of uh, multinational uh, agribusiness enterprises. Uh, I'd say that uh, there are two uh, main interests of these uh, big enterprises in, um, in, in African countries. Uh, one uh, is concerning uh, low, low costs. Uh, we, we have uh, an increasing of uh, costs of production in Brazil, and in some cases, the opportunity to invest in, in Africa represents for Brazilian enterprises an opportunity to produce with uh, low costs. And the second is the proximity uh, to such uh, markets, important markets to, uh, to Brazil. Uh, but uh, 
I, I think also that uh, we need to understand the, um, the interests of uh, Brazilian uh, agriculture in, in Africa, uh, also uh, in terms of um, a multiplicity of interests. Uh, the idea is that, in, in my opinion, uh, Brazil, in a broad sense, not only the entrepreneurial uh, sector, uh, have uh, four different uh, interests in, uh, in Africa. And uh, all of them can be good or uh, can be a problem for uh, African countries. The first one is cooperation in itself. Yes, it exists, I, I suppose. Uh, and the idea here is that uh, in the last decade, uh, the fight against poverty is a priority of a Brazilian state. And then, in this sense, uh, cooperation in itself is uh, uh, an interest uh, for, uh, for Brazil. Uh, the second is uh, business. It's an opportunity to uh, make uh, good, good business for uh, several, several reasons. There is a, a third inst interest that is uh, geopolitical interest. Uh, Brazil um, has a way, has today, uh, 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 an increasing importance in the international scenario, and uh, in, in this sense, uh, to be a partnership with uh, other countries in Latin America, Africa, and Asia is important to the Brazilian project of uh, geo geopolitics. Uh, and fourth, uh, I said uh, there is a, a, a fight, an inter a domestic fight in Brazil around what is the, the face of Brazilian agriculture. For the organizations of uh, the rural social movements, uh, the, the, the face of uh, Brazilian agriculture is uh, the family farming. Uh, is, uh, for, for them, it is an ideological construction, that, uh, that idea that Brazilian agriculture is the big agriculture, the big model, and etc. And, uh, on the other hand, uh, for the, the, the big enterprises, for the capitalists, big capitalists in Brazil, is the contrary. Uh, this is the model uh, uh, they would like to, to export. And then, in the uh, external uh, relations in, in Brazil, uh, in the international cooperation, there is a fight also uh, around the sense of uh, cooperation as uh, an extension of this internal, uh, this domestic fight in, in Brazil. Uh, there wasn't a question directly to me, but I'll answer anyway. <laughs> Just to emphasize that um, the significance of the changes in South Africa in the past 20 years really have to do with agrarian structure. On the one hand, the failure to resolve the dualistic character of agriculture. So the continuation of, uh, of capitalist development in a large-scale sector uh, becoming more consolidated, becoming more integrated into global value chains, while on the other hand we have a large, very neglected family farming sector itself uh, adversely incorporated into, into corporate-dominated value chains. So I think that um, the, these two sides of the, of the farming coin in South Africa sit up very uneasily and are not resolved at present through agricultural policy, uh, which has failed to provide uh, significant structural change or real opportunities for smallholder accumulation in this very hostile deregulated environment with the state having removed many of the instruments it had at its disposal uh, to subsidize and support the emergence of a new farming class. At the same time, I'd say that South African agribusiness is very sensitive to questions of abuse of land rights elsewhere in the continent and ha is very adept at exporting its own model, not only of large-scale commercial agriculture, but partnerships with smallholders. So what I see in the, in the le last few years is the growth of uh, increasingly outgrow models in Southern Africa. And the key questions there are what are the terms of these partnerships? And it's that uh, area which I think deserves a lot more research. Thank you. I have two questions, one on uh, LOC, the lines of credit. Uh, the Indian policy has gone through several changes. Uh, uh, till 2005, it was Government of India which was extending uh, lines of credit. But after that, it was given to the 
Export and Import Bank of India, Exim Bank. And in 2011, the policy has again uh, been broadened to allow not only Exim Bank, but other financial sector uh, entities as well to raise money from the international debt market and provide that as line of credit. What happens is that the rate of interest, which is uh, uh, since it is to be given at much lower rate of interest than prevailing in the international debt market, that differential comes from the government of India. So that, that way it is uh, uh, provided at a subsidized uh, rate. Uh, coming to the question of uh, uh, land grab in, 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 in Ethiopia and the emerging dissent on that, I, I fully agree with you. And I think uh, uh, in the previous uh, uh, um, uh, panel, uh, Regina had this uh, interesting presentation on evidence-based policy making. And I think uh, we, we need to uh, broaden that dialogue and try to see how, how uh, and what lessons can be learned. We don't have to uh, go by um, uh, specific uh, uh, studies which are coming in, but on our own should do uh, much more uh, substantive uh, analysis and then see, uh, but, but I, I, I'm fully with you in terms of uh, uh, um, uh, exchanging and expanding the frontiers of uh, human resource exchange, which you mentioned in terms of agriculture scientists and, and uh, is more in terms of the education sector. So, so I'm, I'm one with you in terms of expanding that. And uh, on, on land grab, yes, I think uh, we need to study that and, and uh, broaden the dialogue. Thank you. My, uh, my statement on the multi actor in Africa was better provocative than scientific. But again, I like to, uh, I like to see that two point here. And uh, this will also relate to what Hans mentioned here. And the one point is that um, uh, the African is in African countries, you see the intellectual capacity to advise government domestically is not very strong like what China and many other countries, like you, any country, you know, you, you, like United States is advised, advised by so many thinking types, you know, you know UK, and, uh, and China as well. But African doesn't have this strong internal intellectual capacity. So when those actors come, and uh, it's very difficult to, to, to balance the intellectual uh, impact whether I'm going to see China's great like this, you know, and the people listen, yeah, yeah, good, you know, and when people come, yeah, you know, it's dis disturbing like this, you know, this is the very so strong, intellectually so articulative and evidence-based, you have uh, projections, uh, data, you have modeling, you know, and those African, pro-Africans have never seen this, you know, yeah, it's very good, you know, this is things in the reality, it's nothing scientific, but it's reality. And uh, secondly, this multi-actor things comes and the and disturbing economically in the sense of uh, weakening of the capacity. Because, uh, you know, they just give a different level of salaries, a package of attractions, you know, and those people working in the government, they would just shift it, you know, to working for donors, for Chinese, for British, for Germans, highly paid, you know, what they should pay, they should work for less paid for the, for the government. You know, all this kind of impact negatively, I would say, this is a multi-actor, uh, involvement, you know, not only politically disturbing the agenda, but also social economically, you know, disturbing the structure, capacity, everything. I'm not going to say multi actor is, is wrong on the right. I'm going to say there's a need for the African, from my perspective, to, to develop a kind of capacity that they can really utilize this multi actors c capacity. This is what China, you know, when the World Bank comes to China, I don't think the World Bank director in China, in China, or like residential director of China could, could open any minister's door, cannot. You know, you need capa national, strong national capacity. And then you could work e really equally with multi donors. And then you can actually bring this kind of negative impact into a positive impact. So that's what I'm going to see the multi actors. You know, we have to see like this, so. Thank you, thank you very much. So thank you for the Excellent comments and excellent questions and uh, a great panel. I think what we have to take away from this panel is the need to move beyond these stereotypes of engagement to, to a reflection on this real variation and diversity that we see. 
we need to move, we need to really reflect on that actually what we see in Africa are often mirrors and reflections of domestic political debates and struggles and histories and they're not just arriving from nowhere we need to move beyond this idea that there are models out there that can be replicated and transferred to principles of learning experience and so on that all of you talked about and we also need to not just reify the notion of BRICS. Uh, we must talk about how relations of capital evolve in the context of an unequal world. And that's a very, very old debate and one that is not going to go away very quickly. So if you want to follow up on some of these debates, there's a particular parallel session uh, that follows this, which, as it were, takes the African end of the story, uh, reflecting on four countries' experiences. And if you want to also follow up there are two leaflets in your packs, one from the IDS-led Rising Powers in Development uh, program, which facilitated the, this session, and one from the FAC, uh, China and Brazil in African Agriculture program, uh, which uh, is going to be reflected particularly in the following session. But it leaves to me just to thank the panel for an excellent plenary session, and uh, thank you. And now it's tea time.